الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الحمد لله We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this gathering and inshallah today uh, after a few weeks break we'll be continuing our series following <coughs> the book by Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim The Disease and the Cure Again just to give a quick recap we do this often but just in case we have somebody new coming in um, the book is basically written by Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, who was born around 700 years ago. And it was written in response to a question by an anonymous questioner who asked about some severe, severe calamity in his life or her life and them trying to find a cure for that calamity, whether that's a physical disease or a disease of the heart or a mental disease. And in response to that question, trying to find a cure for this person, Imam Ibn al-Qayyim wrote a comprehensive book that goes over all sorts of issues, talking about the diseases, the cures, and how every disease has a cure, and the biggest cures for disease are the cure for ignorance, and the cure for ignorance is to ask and to seek knowledge. So Imam Ibn al-Qayyim is setting out, when he wrote this book, he set out, to dispel ignorance and to share knowledge. So this book is comprehensive. It talks about aspects of aqidah, it talks about some aspects of fiqh, it talks about some aspects of the seerah. It is very comprehensive and it is beneficial to everybody. Last time where we left off previously, we mentioned the types of sins, meaning what categories of sins there are. We talked about the devilish type of sins, we talked about the authoritarian type of sins, the predatory sins, and the animalistic sins. And we also talked about the severity of sins, how all sins are not the same. Some sins are major sins, some sins are minor sins. And the scholars, they deduced certain parameters of what a major sin is. Of course, some of these are that whenever the curse of Allah or the curse of the Messenger وسلم, is upon an action or a upon the doer of an action, that means that's a major sin. Or if there is some punishment described in the hereafter, or if the Quran and the Sunnah both mention that, that sin, then it's a major sin. So there's multiple different parameters. And going through these parameters, we have several sins in, that come into this category. Probably 70 plus sins that can be categorized as major sins. And we talked about the importance of the major sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a promise to the believers that the one who avoids the major sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wipe away his minor sins. And from this the scholars deduced that the one who does not commit major sins, or he has already committed major sins and he has repented sincerely, he is the one that will be safe from the hellfire. The, the hellfire will never touch him. He is safe. This is the importance of avoiding the major sins. And on the topic of the major sins, we must speak about the worst sin that there, prob there is, there possibly is. And this is the sin of shirk. This is the worst sin that anyone can ever do. Any creature can ever do. It is this sin. And in fact, before we even describe this sin, let us describe the purpose of existence itself. Because this sin contradicts the purpose of existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Qur'an that He did not create man or jinn except to worship Allah. And many times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He created mankind to test Him. Now, the reason that we are even living and breathing, it is for the sake of Allah. It is to worship Allah. It is to love Allah. It is to obey Allah. It is to fear Allah. It is to have hope in Allah. Everything is revolving around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every breath that we take is for His sake. Everything. The purpose of even the plants, the animals, the planets, the rocks, mountains, any inanimate object that you can imagine. The reason it was created was to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, the greatest justice, the greatest justice, the greatest thing that anyone can ever do is to worship Allah. It is to obey Allah, it is to love Allah, it is to fear Allah, it is to have hope in Allah. And the greatest injustice that anyone can ever do is to oppose this purpose. 
to go against this purpose and to commit shirk. And mainly, shirk falls into the definition of ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Basically, what it comes down to is likening the creation to the creator. Now, when we think about Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran that there is nothing like Him. There is nothing like Him. The mind cannot even perceive Allah. The mind cannot even think to even begin to imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He is described, He is separate from the universe. He is exalted. He is above the throne in a manner that befits His majesty. So He is completely unique. Nothing from the creation is like Him. And nothing in creation has any level next to Him. He is completely alone. And so this is what Tawheed is. The oneness of Allah. Singling out Allah completely. And in terms of Tawheed, there are different parts of Tawheed that describe that complete this, this Tawheed. First and foremost is the Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, Lordship. So, belief and acknowledgement and understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is the creator. He alone is the provider. He alone is the one who causes life and death. He alone is the one who controls everything in the universe. So this is his lordship. His oneness, and his uniqueness in his lordship. He alone is the king. He alone is the only God. Then is the type of Tawheed called Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. So, the Tawheed of his names and his attributes. So when we say Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Sami' Al-Basir, when we say these names, we mean that this is alone for him. So there is no one merciful like Allah. When we say that he is the all-seeing, we cannot even begin to mention or explain his seeing, how he sees, because it is nothing like the creation. When we say that He is the all-hearing, we cannot even begin to explain how this is. The Muslims do not go into explaining how, but we know that it is nothing like the creation. He is alone and He is unique. And none of His creation can ever match Him in these names and in these attributes. And finally, is the type of Tawheed called Tawheed al uluhiya So, the Tawheed in worship. And this is the type where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is worthy of worship. He alone is singled out in worship. Now when we see some of the shirk that happens in the world, oftentimes it's in this last category. It's in this last category and people ascribe partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His right to be worshipped alone. So of course, those are the types of tawheed. So the opposite of them, are, we can find the types of shirk. So first and foremost, opposing lordship and associating partners with him in terms of his lordship. So this is, if someone has the belief, we have different types of polytheists, mushriks, who believe that lordship is shared, billah, that there are multiple creators, or there are multiple destroyers, or there are multiple sustainers. This is completely false, and Muslims completely reject this. And this is the greatest evil this is the greatest evil that anyone can ever say. The next is ascribing partners in names and attributes. So some people, they will say that Allah alone is the creator, but He has made some of His creation almost at His own level. So He has created some of His creation that is all-seeing, or all-hearing, or all-knowing. This is also false. This is complete shirk. Only Allah is the all-seeing. Only Allah is the all-hearing. Only Allah is the all-known. Allah does not share His power with any of His creation. So this is how we single out Allah in His Lordship and in His names and attributes. And finally, we come to the partners in worship. And this is again very interesting to understand. What was the crime of the mushrikeen of Quraysh? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Qur'an, he commands the Messenger وسلم, ask them, who created them? And they will reply, Allah created them. And who provides for them? They will reply, Allah provides for them. 
So Allah is telling the Messenger وسلم, that if you ask the mushriks of Quraysh, who made them and who provides for them, they will reply Allah. So how were they mushriks? Because they associated partners in worship. They used to believe that their pious ancestors or some pious man amongst them, when we talk about Allah and Al-Uzza and all these false deities that they used to worship, oftentimes they were human beings who died. And then they would raise their status after their death and treat them like they were gods. So they believed that Allah is the creator and Allah created them. But then they believed that Allah raised the rank of these dead people and you can ask them for help. And this is complete shirk. Muslims do not call upon the dead for help. Muslims do not go to graves to worship the graves. Muslims do not go to idols and worship idols and ask them for help. This was the crime of the mushrikeen of Quraysh. They believe Allah is the, the sole creator. They believe Allah is alone in his names and attributes. But they associated partners with him in terms of his worship. Despite having that belief. So this is actually very important to understand. It is not enough to just believe in one God. It is not enough to just believe that that one God is all powerful. But to complete Tawheed, to complete submission to Allah, it is to submit to Allah. It is to worship Him alone. It is to single Him out in worship and stay away from all forms of shirk and to reject the Taghut. This is what it means to purify Tawheed. And unfortunately, we see some people who go to extremes. They will think that they're pious, some pious person from the, from the past, who they call a saint or a wali. They will say that this person now has superhuman abilities after his death. And you can go to the grave of this person or even from a far away. They'll say you can sit in your home and you can call upon this person while he is in his grave and he will help you. This is shirk. And Islam completely rejects this, this practice. And this in fact was the crime of Quraysh. And even when you look at other, you know, other religions, if you ask a Jew, how many gods are there? A Jew will re reply to you, one God. There is only one God. But again, they are still mushriks. They are mushriks because of the other associating partners that they have done. Because one time the Messenger وسلم, asked a former, a new convert to Islam. He used to be from Bani Israel. He was from Bani Israel. He used to be a Jew and then he accepted Islam. And then he said that you used to worship your, your, your rabbis and your popes. And then he replied, Ya Rasulullah, we didn't worship them. We just respected them, but we didn't really worship them. He said when they said that this is right, when in fact it is wrong, and when they made, when they made the halal haram and when they made the haram halal, did you listen to them or not? And he said, yes. He said, so this is shirk. So the one who tries to manipulate the laws of Allah, the one who tries to change the laws of Allah, or the one who tries to say that the laws of man are greater than the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even this is shirk. So again, this is a very important reminder to us that we might think that tawheed is a straightforward thing and I could never, I could never fall into this. But this was such a dangerous thing that the Messenger وسلم, he used to make dua to save himself from shirk. And he taught us this dua, he used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lam wa astaghfiruka lima la a'lam. O oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from knowingly associating anything with you, and I seek your forgiveness for that which I do unknowingly. So this was taught to us, and this was reminded to us by the Messenger وسلم, constantly seek refuge from shirk. Constantly. And in fact, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he used to make dua, O oh Allah, put me and my family on one side of the earth and put the mushrikeen on the other side of the earth. That's how much he hated shirk. That's how much he dissociated himself from shirk. So this is something that is a very serious matter. Because this one sin can nullify everything. It nullifies everything and we are told that nothing is accepted from the mushrikeen. So there could be a mushrik and he gives billions of dollars in donation. He is kind. He doesn't backbite people. He doesn't do anything. But he commits shirk. Nothing from him will be accepted. Because he has contradicted the purpose of life. 
which is to single out Allah in worship, which is to acknowledge His Lordship, acknowledge His uniqueness. And anyone who dies in this state, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He forgives any sin except shirk. The one who dies in the state of shirk, He will not forgive them. So this is a reminder for us, and that is the purpose of our life, to reject shirk, to apply tawheed in our life, and to spread this message of tawheed. And now just to give some other examples of shirk. This is the example of what the Hindus believe. The Hindus believe, in fact, even if you ask a Hindu now in modern Hinduism, if you ask them how many gods are there, they will actually say there's only one god. If you ask them this, how many gods are there? A Hindu, the one that we say they have millions of gods, they will say there's one god. Their belief is actually pantheism. They believe that there is one God, and everyone is a piece of that God. A'udhu Billah. This is actually their belief, and this is where they get their millions of gods. They believe that God, A'udhu Billah, is everywhere. In His essence, in His that, every, everything is God. This is where they are mushrikeen from. So, this is why they make idols, this is why they worship trees, this is why they worship cows, this is why they worship each other. Because they believe there's a part of God, A'udhu Billah, in every, everyone. And of course, we reject this. This is a complete false statement. They have no knowledge regarding this, and this is complete shirk. This is called pantheism. The next is atheism, which is the complete rejection of Allah. And this is the peak of arrogance, and this falls into shirk. So every atheist is also a mushrik. The one who rejects the existence of Allah, without a doubt, they are from the mushrikeen. Another example of falling into shirk, this was an early deviant sect and they were called the Jahmiya and they used to reject the names of Allah and attributes of Allah. So they used to say that Allah exists but Allah cannot see, A'udhu Billah, or Allah cannot hear, or Allah cannot speak. They used to say this because they say this is a characteristic of a creation so we cannot liken this to the, to the Creator. But again, we say, Allah's speech is unique. It is unimaginable. When we say Allah speaks, and we say a creation speaks, it, there is no comparison. You cannot compare the Creator to the creation. There is nothing like Him. So this is also a misguided sect. And this is a pathway towards shirk. Another form of shirk we see is from the Christians. Ask any Christian, they'll say they, they believe in one God. They'll always say this. Any Christian you ask, they, they'll say they believe in one God. But in fact, when you look at their reality, they believe in Trinity. They believe in one God in three persons. This is shirk. They have elevated Isa to the level of divinity. They have ascribed a partner to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, their sin, when they say, Audhu Billah, that Allah has a son, or that he is, or Isa alayhi salam is equal to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that their sin is so severe that the heavens and the earth want to rip apart. They're about to rip apart just at the mention of this thing. But Allah holds them together. Allah holds the heavens and the earth together from ripping apart at this evil word. So this is complete rejection. This is complete shirk. And this is where we also, we have to mention that we, can, we have to reject modern types of thought. Sometimes people say that, oh, even Christians, if they've learned about Islam and they reject Islam, they can still go to heaven. Or Jews can still go to heaven. Islam completely rejects this. The one who is knowledgeable of Islam, who has heard of Islam, who has heard the call to Tawheed, and the one who sticks to his religion despite that, whether he is a Jew or a Christian, he dies as a mushrik and Allah rejects everything from him. So this is an important part of our religion as well. That our brothers are only our brothers in Islam. Only our brothers in deen. There are no Abrahamic brothers. There are no brothers in deen with the Jews. And there are no brothers in deen with the Christians. We are only brothers to one another. Only Muslim to Muslim. The next type of shirk or an example of shirk we have is from another early sect. is from the Qadariyya. And they were, they had the problem of limiting Allah's power. Again, it goes back to his names and attributes. So they used to reject the qadr of Allah. They rejected that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had knowledge of the future or he had already written it down and decreed it. And of course, we know 
From the beginning of time until the end of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly what will happen. And He has already written it. And He has complete knowledge of it. But as we mentioned in a previous lecture, this does not contradict free will. Every single one of us has free will. Every single one of us has the choice to do good or to do evil. But it falls within the qadr of Allah. It falls within the power of Allah. By His power, by His knowledge, He already knows what we will do with our free will. But the blame is ours. If we do something evil and we go along, along the wrong path, the blame is ours. We cannot say that, oh Allah, you made me do this. The next one we mentioned previously is grave worshipping and calling upon the dead. So if you ask somebody, why do you go to this person's grave and why do you call upon him? He says, I call upon this dead person because he was a righteous slave of Allah and he can help me connect with Allah. This is exactly what the Catholic Christians say today. Christians, Catholics, they do this today. They have their saints and they call upon their saints and they call upon the Virgin Mary and they ask the Virgin Mary to ask Allah to help them. Similarly, there are some groups that do this, who call themselves Muslims. They will sit at home, they will call upon some man in his grave and they will say, oh so and so help me. Oh, so and so help me. Oh, so and so do this for me. Again, this is shirk. We are taught as Muslims to call upon Allah alone, to make dua to Allah alone. As the Messenger ﷺ said, dua is ibadah. When we raise our hands to ask help, the heart only inclines towards Allah. That is it. That is it. We cannot call upon a prophet. We cannot call upon an angel. We cannot call upon anyone in their grave for help. The only one we can call upon for help, for our needs, for forgiveness, for guidance is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that is it. This is our iman, this is our aqidah, and anything that contradicts it, it is out of Islam. This is, it, it is shirk to call upon the dead for help. And finally, worshipping anything other than Allah or raising anything to the rank of Allah. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Qur'an, have you seen the one who has taken his desires as his Lord? So this is actually what's common amongst the atheists, amongst those in modern times. We see kuffar pop stars and all these different influencers and, and stuff. They worship their desires. They worship their nafs. They have made their desires their God. They have made money their God. They have made their pleasure their God. They have made this dunya their God. So even though an atheist will say, I don't believe in God or I don't, I don't worship anyone, he worships himself. That is the shirk of the atheists. And that is the shirk of, of many, many mushrikeen of modern time. And even to love anyone more than Allah, to fear, to fear anyone more than Allah, to have hope in anyone more than Allah, all these fall into shirk. So we worship Allah alone. We believe in Him as our one creator, our one sustainer, our one provider. We believe in Him in His all complete uniqueness, in all His names and attributes. Everything that He has described Himself in the Quran and the Sunnah, we believe in that and we ascribe that. We love Him more than any creation. We fear Him more than any creation. We have hope in His mercy and His promises more than anything. And we believe in everything that He has ever revealed in the Quran. This is the Iman of the believer. This is the Aqeedah of the believer. And this is the path of saving ourselves from shirk. And now there are other types of shirk as well. And this is minor shirk. And the Messenger Wasallam said to his Sahaba that I fear this form of shirk for you. I fear it severely. Now this shirk might not be enough. So this shirk, this is minor shirk, it will not put somebody on outside of Islam. So he is still a Muslim if he does this. However, he is in severe danger. This is a major sin and it is categorized as minor shirk. And what is this? This is showing off in your good deeds. Showing off in ibadah. This is minor shirk. And this is a path towards major shirk. So the one who is standing in prayer, he's alone and he's lazy. And then whenever it happens, whenever someone comes in, then he straightens his back. Then he starts praying more perfectly. This person needs to check himself. And he needs to ask 
this worship that I am doing, am I doing it for the sake of Allah or am I doing it to show people? Whenever someone's fasting, maybe he fasts Mondays or Thursdays. And a person has a habit, he likes to announce to the people, oh, today I'm fasting, today I'm, I'm fasting, today I'm fasting. He needs to check himself. Why am I announcing this to the people? Why am I sharing this with the people? Do I want the praise for them? Is this why I'm, why I'm doing this? So this is a very hidden danger for all Muslims. Every time we do any good deed, the intention must be, I do this for the sake of Allah. I do this for the sake of Allah. And even if, say, you're standing in prayer, Someone comes and you feel yourself straightening up more. Shaitan will say, oh, you did it for him. Then you must actually have an internal battle in your mind, in your heart. Then no, I'm doing this for the sake of Allah. Correct your intention. Even in the middle of ibadah, even in the middle of, of prayer, correct your intention. And this is a lifelong battle. This is the battle that the shaitan will wage against the Muslim until his last dying breath. The next type of minor shirk, is actually, I've, uh, we've seen it amongst our, our groups, is swearing by other than Allah. So when you swear, when you say that, I swear to Allah I did this, or I swear to Allah this is the truth. The only swearing can be done by Allah. So the one, Audhu Billah, who says, I swear by my mother, or I swear by my father, I swear by my grandmother, is actually minor shirk. We are not allowed to swear by anyone other than Allah. So if you are put to the test and somebody says like you're a witness and you swear to Allah you see this or of course we should not use this word you know just just loosely but when the time comes if you must testify or if you must tell the truth or you are a witness to something the only one you can swear by is Allah swearing by Allah alone other types of shirk and these vary some are minor shirks some are major shirk but most of them are actually major shirk and of course, we could do a separate topic on this alone. And this is astrology. Belief that the stars have control over the day-to-day -day activities of people. Or the ones who say, oh, I'm a Sagittarius, or I'm this, or I'm, I'm a Capricorn, or I'm this, and I'm that, zodiac signs. The one who believes that Allah has set these in place, and these are like signs, that these are, these are a valid signs that one follows. That's minor shirk. To believe that Allah has set it, because Allah has not set these in place. We are not taught from the Quran and the Sunnah at all to look to the stars to tell us what is going on in life. The one who believes that these have control independent from Allah, that is major shirk. So we must be very wary. We see this commonly. Some people have it in their profiles. I'm a Sagittarius or I'm a Capricorn or I'm a, I'm a Cancer or whatever. This is a dangerous path and Islam completely rejects this. We completely reject astrology. We understand, and don't, don't mistake this with astronomy. Astronomy is the study of the characteristics of the stars, the characteristics of the planets, how the planets move, how the sun moves, how their gravity pulls on one another, how the meteors move. That's astronomy. Astrology is the belief that these stars and their movements have effect on people's futures or have effect on people's day-to-day -day lives. This is what we completely reject. Similar to this is fortune telling. Fortune telling. Reading hands, reading tarot cards, looking at someone's face and saying, oh, this is gonna happen in your future. This is shirk. The Messenger ﷺ said, the one who goes to a fortune teller and believes in him, completely believes what he has said. He has disassociated, disassociated, he has disassociated himself from what I have come with. And the one who just goes to him playfully, meaning he says, I don't believe in an astrologer and I don't believe in uh, a fortune teller or a hand reader. I'm just going to go to him just for fun. The Messenger وسلم, said for 40 days his prayers will be rejected. This is the severity of fortune telling. This is the severity of astrology. Similar to this are believing in bad omens. So a black cat or walking under a ladder or don't do this at this time, or don't do this at this time, whatever is not proven from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. This is a form of minor shirk if somebody believes that Allah has set this in place, and it can lead to major shirk. Again, Muslims reject bad omens. We have complete tawakkul in Allah. Whatever Allah wills, that will happen. We do not look at the dunya to find bad omens or signs. Next one is amulets. Wearing some type of 
necklaces. You've seen that little blue eye mark that is very common. They believe that if you put that, you're safe from nazar. Sometimes you see a little hand mark and they have that blue line or that blue color within them. This is a form of shirk and the Muslims should never divulge in this. We have been given the keys of protection. It is through ruqya. It is through dhikr of Allah. It is through the remembrance of Allah. We are told that when we recite the last three, the surahs of the Quran, that protects us from all sorts of black magic, all sorts of nazar, all sorts of evil things that might happen to us. That is enough for us. The words of Allah, the Quran and the sunnah, that is enough protection for us. We do not need to seek out amulets for protection. And this again can lead to severe and major shirk. Next one is self-explanatory is magic. Anyone who partakes in magic, anyone who seeks out magic, and of course, magic involves calling upon jinn and calling upon jinn and worshipping them. This is complete shirk and puts someone outside the bounds of Islam. So this is a very severe, severe warning that we are given regarding magic, black magic. And this, of course, we have other, other aspects of this as well, but this is some of the main examples, some of the main types of shirk. And so it is upon us to understand again that the purpose of our life, the purpose of our existence is to worship Allah, is to believe that He is our creator, our sustainer, to believe that He is unique. He is separate from the universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes Himself that He is above the throne, in a manner that befits His Majesty. There is nothing like Him. The mind cannot even imagine Him. That is the aqidah of the Muslims. He alone is worthy of worship. He has no partners. His divine law that is revealed in the Quran, it is the best law. It is the only law to follow. No man-made law is better than the law of Allah. And all these different types of omens and astrology and amulets, we reject all these. And we have complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have complete tawakkul in Allah. We believe in the qadr of Allah. We believe in everything that has been revealed in the Quran and the Sunnah. So it is important for us to constantly revise this, constantly make sure that we are not falling into or even coming close to these aspects of shirk and constantly make dua, the same dua that the Messenger made to protect us and save us from shirk. So inshallah with that we will conclude and in the following sessions we will talk about other major sins which are mainly speaking about Allah without knowledge and bid'ah, innovation, bringing in new things in the deen. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us and guide us and to put us upon the straight path. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify us, to save us from shirk, to help us in completely submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and applying tawheed in every aspect of our lives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help the Muslims wherever they are in need, especially in Gaza. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to free them to strengthen them, to raise their ranks in the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant guidance to the Muslim rulers and to unite the masses and to help us and strengthen us like we once were in the past. Subhana rabbika rabbil azzati amma yasifun wa salamu ala mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. If anyone has any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to share them. It doesn't have to be with this topic either. Anything on your mind that you'd like to share, inshallah. Mm -hmm. So the question is um, How can we in this day and age Of so much misinformation And so much You know Opinions How can we find the correct answers Of course I mean the best way of seeking knowledge Is the knowledge How it, it came from The early Sahaba And the 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 Salaf al-Salih, they used to sit with the people of knowledge, they used to go to the scholars, they used to sit with them, dedicate time and effort into seeking that knowledge. Now oftentimes, we need quick answers. So the question was, is there some website or, or somewhere where we can find out you know, answers quickly? I will say, 
first and foremost, what, how can we even distinguish who is a good scholar and who is not? First and foremost, he is the one who always emphasizes the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Always the Qur'an and the Sunnah. When you look at the four Imams, and we respect all the four Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, um, Imam Malik, Imam, Imam al-Shafi, every single one of them, they followed the same methodology, which is the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and following the consensus of the Sahaba. All of them, all of them were, it was their goal, it was their mission, that we will, any ruling, any verdict that we give, it will be from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And they even said, that if you ever see something from the Qur'an and the Sunnah that contradicts our opinion, put our opinion to the side and always take the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Every one of them said this. So that is the method. And so when you see a scholar, Online, there's several, so many scholars, like you'll see thousands of videos, hundreds of different scholars. Just see how much he is quoting from the evidences, how much he is calling upon, you know, in the Quran says this, the, you know, the, the hadith said this, and the, the great four scholars. So see how much he is quoting from the main scholars of Islam. And me personally, of course, in the Arabic language, of course, I am deficient in this. I cannot speak Arabic. I don't understand Arabic. I'm learning, but I'm not there yet. In the English language, the site, the website that I have found most beneficial, and of course no one is perfect, no one is, no one is perfect, sometimes you'll find opinions that are incorrect on there, sometimes they make mistakes, everybody is human, but islamqa.info, this is one of the websites, they quote from scholars uh, like Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan, Sheikh Ibn Baz, um, uh, Sheikh Albani, and the standing committee in Saudi Arabia, their consensus, whenever they answer some question, they go through the research, they find the fatawa from these ulama, and then they try to answer based on these fatawa. In my personal experience, if I need a quick answer on something, maybe it's some fiqh issue, maybe it's some, some quick answer that I need, islamqa.info for a quick answer. However, I will say, if there is some deep question, you know, something pertaining to you, something unique about your situation, something that you cannot find an easy answer for, you must seek out a scholar. You must seek out somebody who is knowledgeable. You cannot just go online and seek every answer online. There are some matters that are, you know, very deep and that require individual and unique fatawa for that situation. So in that situation, I always advise, seek someone out who is much more knowledgeable than you, find out, go to our seniors, they will help you get in touch with scholars. If you have a, like, you know, a big question, they will help you get in touch with scholars and get that question answered. But for quick, quick answers, for simple matters, I recommend islamqa.info, very good website. For the English language, you will find lots and lots of answers there. Like a lie. Yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've, Allah, I need to do more research on this, but I think even the, there was a difference of opinion even amongst the Sahaba, that some said that it's permissible to have ayat of the Qur'an and, you know, have them with you for protection. Some of them, they, they didn't. But the, the problem is from a practical perspective, like if we have that on, we're not always going to take it off when we go to the bathroom or something. You know, that is, is, you're going to, eventually, someone's going to inadvertently disrespect that. Someone's going to go wearing those ayat on his, on his back and enter the bathroom, or do some evil deed, or do some type of disrespect. So it is better that whenever you need protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this will help us even more, rather than it just being hanging on our neck, it should be upon our tongues. So whenever we need protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, call upon Allah. Memorize the Qur'an as much as we can, especially the proven, uh, uh, the proven surahs that are, that are there to protect us. For example, Surah Al-Mulk, the Messenger of said that whoever recites it at night, every night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect him from uh, the punishment of the grave. And similarly, Surah Al-Ikhlas and the final two surahs of, of the Qur'an, whoever recites them three times each, each time, so a total of, of nine times, he will be protected from evil eye, he will be protected from magic, he will be protected. So the power of those words are from reciting them and believing in them. So I think it is better that we avoid them. I've never done it 
myself. I never, never wear it, never do that. Try to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your heart and with your tongue. Sorry. Could you? No, like like we mentioned. So this that's that's like a you know a matter that is not light. Like whenever you swear by Allah, it should be something that's very important. It is exactly something serious. Yeah, you should not. Uh, I've seen many you know. Unfortunately, people, they, they say wallahi over everything, everything, wallahi, 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 everything. That is not appropriate. That is not appropriate to take, you know, swear by Allah on every little matter. So it should be when somebody is testifying or somebody is saying something very important or trying to get a very important message across, that's when, you know, we should swear by Allah. And of course, we only swear by Allah. We cannot swear by anyone other than Allah. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Forbidden act. Yeah, forbidden. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, but yeah, but they reject the hereafter, here, hereafter. Nothing. Yeah, they get. Mm. Yeah, he gives them. Yep. So yeah, his sustenance is written for everybody. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written sustenance even for the non-believers. So even, even they will get it. So the main thing for us to take away is that whenever we see the, you know, the riches that they have, don't get you know, demotivated when you see the riches. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just, he has written rizq for them as well. And their money is a test for them. Their money is a test for them to see whether they will come back to the light and accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. But of course, the Muslims are the ones who seek good in this life and the hereafter. So the one who works hard, the Muslim who works hard, inshallah, he will see his fruits in this life and the hereafter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely.
this reason, that's part of it. You don't know this reason? I don't know what it is. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Yeah, there's a, there's a wisdom behind everything. There's a wisdom behind everything. And I would like to mention one thing as well here. Talking about risk and, you know, being given something in life and, and the hereafter and all, all this. One time, I don't know the exact uh, reference to this, but I'll try to find it. A pious man who was very rich. So he was a believer and he was rich. Very, very rich. He was walking through the market and he sees a poor Jew. So it's a Jewish man who is extremely poor, dirt poor on, on the ground. And the, the Jew kind of mocks him and he says that according to your religion, the kuffar have a share in this dunya and you have a share in the hereafter. But look at this, I'm still poor. I'm a kafir by your standards, but I'm still poor. And you're a believer and you're rich. You're the richest amongst us. He says to him, in the hereafter, when I go to Jannah, despite the riches that I had, this dunya will feel like Jahannam. And when you go to Jahannam in the hereafter, if you die like this, the dunya that you had will feel like Jannah to you. So that is the whole perspective of the dunya in the hereafter. So the rich man, he says, when I go to Jannah, even the billions of dollars that I had, it will feel like hell. I will never want to go back to those billions of dollars after I've entered Jannah. And you, as a disbeliever, when you enter the hellfire, even if you were the poorest, most disabled person on this earth, you will think that that poverty was Jannah. So that is the perspective that we should have of this dunya and the hereafter. But of course, Allah has written rizq for everybody. And Allah has told us to work hard. Everyone must, must work hard. I give this example sometimes. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted, from day one, when He revealed the message to the Prophet He could have made the entire Arabian Peninsula, the entire world into Muslim. Easy. Just like that. But no. He made the Prophet work hard. He made him persevere. He made him go out into the land and give da'wah. He made the Sahaba work hard. He made them stand up at night in prayer. He made them go pick up their swords and fight against the enemies. He made them go and persevere and work hard. So there is a value in working hard. There is a value in pursuing success. Of course, our main priority is the hereafter. But also there is an extreme beneficial value in pursuing success in this life. And we are, this is our method. This is the method of the Muslims to work hard and trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, we see the kuffar, they work hard in this dunya. Their only goal is, in, is this dunya. So the one who works hard, Allah gives him the dunya. And then in the hereafter, he will see the reality of what the dunya really was. Good questions. So the question is, how can I constantly be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despite the distractions in life when sometimes you feel like you're not thinking about Him enough? Of course, this is what you're aspiring for. This is a level of ihsan. This is like the level that you know, the prophets had. This is, the, this is the level that the best of the sahaba had of being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. And of course, you should strive for ihsan. This is a good thing. It is, we, should astri we should strive to be the best that we can be. We might fall short, but at least the goalpost was the highest that we could be. One recommendation I could give is that, of course, while avoiding the sins, everything that we do, 
make it in your mindset that I do this for the sake of Allah. So from the moment the alarm clock rings for the Fajr prayer, say Bismillah, and you say, oh Allah, I, I'm getting out of this bed for your sake. I'm going to get out of bed for your sake. I'm going to walk to the bathroom for your sake. In your mind, in your mind, in your heart. As you're walking, you're thinking to yourself, Ya Allah, this is for you. When you're making wudu, Ya Allah, this is for you. When you're done prayer, prayer, of course, this is for you. Then even when you go to eat, even when you go to eat, when you say Bismillah, even think to yourself that Allah, I'm eating this food for you. You gave it to me. I thank you. I find pleasure in eating this. And this is going to give me sustenance so that I can continue living and continue worshipping you. When you go to work, think to yourself, Ya Allah, I'm going for you. Because you made this work a path for me to sustenance. You made this halal wealth for me. So I work hard, whether that's an office job, it's a labor job, whatever. Say, Allah, I do this for you. I'm doing this job for your sake. You gave me this, I'm earning halal income from this. When you put your clothes on, think, oh Allah, I do this for you. I cover myself because you like modesty. I wear nice clothes because you like beauty. I'm kind to my mother and my parents and all those around me because you like you have commanded this. If you make this mindset, this is the level of ihsan that a believer could be getting good deeds 24-7. Even before sleep. Before sleep, make the niyyah, oh Allah, I'm going to sleep for your sake so that I can wake up, energize and worship you more. Everything, everything in your, in your life, make it your intention, oh Allah, I do this for your sake. When you see some evil, and of course we're human beings, we get inclined towards evil, we get inclined towards sins. Say to yourself, Allah, I'm inclined towards this sin. The only reason I will not do this sin is because of you. Because of Allah, because you have forbidden it. So I will not do this sin. In this sense, if, you, if we practice this enough, then inshallah we will reach a very high level of iman. But that's what we can try. That's what we can try to save us from distraction. Even when you're talking to your brother. So say you see some brother at the masjid. Before you even say salam to him, make, make your intention, Oh Allah, I'm going to go say salam to him for your sake. I'm going to go smile at him for your sake. I'm going to go talk to him for your sake. Because you love brotherhood amongst us. So in that sense, make it your intention in everything that you do in life. Everything halal, permissible that you do in life. Make it your, even when you go work out. Even when you go to the gym. Make your intention, O oh Allah, I am keeping my body fit for your sake so that I can continue to worship you. So that if I must defend myself and I must defend my family and I must defend this ummah, I am strong enough to do that. So everything, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, try to make that intention for the sake of Allah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in this. Good question. <clears throat> So inshallah we'll conclude with that and uh, I will see you all inshallah next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.